Before Science Topics, which today looks at the senses, teachers may like to know that the BBC is publishing a series of computer-assisted learning software series. It be obtained from BBC Publications, Schools Orders Section, 144 Bermondsey Street, London SE1 3TH. Further details can be found in the leaflet sent to schools at the beginning of term. Every day, our brains receive thousands of messages from our senses. We're restrained by the outside world. Touch is a sense that gives us a direct fit of the world. Our hands are full of touch sensors. They're sensitive enough to feel the weave in a piece of fabric or the texture of skin. Feet can feel too. Tight shoes are really painful. We can choose which shoes to wear, but we can't always choose which sounds to hear. Some sounds carry important information. Others are just fun. Traffic can be very noisy. It's also very smelly. Luckily, we're sensitive to a wide range of smells. And smell is an important part of taste as well. To taste our food, we have to eat it, of course, but we can sample the world from a distance with our eyes. Most of our information about the world comes through our eyes. It's the sense we depend on most to help us survive in a busy and often dangerous world. Our sight and all our other senses have special nerve cells called receptors, which respond to what's happening outside and inside the body. So how does sight work? Light enters the eye and shines on a layer at the back called the retina. The retina contains all our sense receptors for light. They're called rods and cones, and they convey a signal the brain can understand. The rods and cones trigger electric impulses, which travel along the nerve pathway to the brain. Nerve cells are a special shape for carrying messages, as we can see if we look closely at one of them. As well as the main part of the cell, there's a long thread called the axon. The nerve impulses can travel along the axon at 100 meters per second. An axon may be only a tenth of a millimeter, or as long as a meter. They are connected to many other nerve cells. And if we look closely at one of these connections, we can see the nerve pathway isn't continuous. There's a gap called a synapse. At the synapse, the signal is passed on chemically. The nerve impulses trigger the release of special chemicals which cross the gap to the next nerve cell. This second nerve cell then fires as well and passes the message on. Finally, the impulses reach the part of the brain that processes visual signals, 
and the message is analyzed and interpreted. In response, messages are sent to other parts of the brain and then on to the rest of the body. The whole brain weighs about one and a half kilograms. It has many complex structures, but most of our conscious thought goes on in the thin surface layer called the cortex. The cortex is only four millimeters thick, but it does have a large surface area. This fits into a much smaller space because of its crumpled folds. Up to two thirds of the cortex is devoted to processing information about the senses. This picture shows only one cell in a hundred, and each cell has connections with many other cells. Altogether, the brain contains 100,000 million nerve cells, making a very complex communication system capable of processing huge quantities of information very fast. The brain needs to be fast in sport, where we have to use and coordinate all our senses. In a fast ball game like squash, you'd think the main thing was to keep your eye on the ball. But a surprising amount of information comes through the ear, as Suzanne is about to find out. Suzanne Burgess is ranked 10th in the country for women's squash, but even she will find it difficult playing under these conditions. The music conflicts with the sounds Suzanne would normally hear in the squash court, so she keeps missing the ball. So how hard was it playing under these conditions? Well, it was much more difficult because you couldn't tell how hard you were hitting the ball and it was really slowing down your reaction time because you take a lot of signals from your hearing that, that you don't really realise until you haven't got them there. Candy could hear normally, so her game wasn't affected. It was much easier for me because Suzanne took longer to respond to the ball and I often managed to wrong foot Suzanne because she couldn't hear where I was putting the ball and so she was off balance when she played her shot. Yes, I was having to turn right round to look at the ball, whereas before you just automatically do it by hearing. And you know how it sounds, so you know where it is. Suzanne needed information from all her senses. When her ears couldn't hear the ball, she relied on her eyes much more and kept missing it. <laughs> Scientists at Loughborough University study many other sports besides squash. So what sensors do we use in a sport like tennis? I think one of the most basic sensors is kinesthesis. That's knowing where your body is at all times. It's really made up of three parts. The first is balance. We have to know whether we're falling over or running or leaning. The second part is touch, the development of touch, the pressure through the feet, the feel of the racket in the hand. And the third one, and a very important one, is knowing the angles of the joints knowing the stretch in the muscles, and knowing where each little part of our body is at all times. Those three things added together make up kinesthesis. How efficient and fast are our senses? Well, if we take the eye, the reaction time with the eye to see something out there, take it in and recognize it and start some action, is about two tenths of a second. Now, if somebody's serving very fast, as in tennis, what that means is that we see the ball crossing the net, actually hitting the shot. The yellow ball shows where the real ball actually is. The red ball shows where we think the ball is. The difference between the two is our reaction time. The real ball moves so fast that the delay in our perception of it means we see it at the net when it's already reached us. So how does the brain cope with this? 
Well, first of all, the brain really doesn't have to cope with all of it at a conscious level. There's a sort of hierarchy of conscious levels. For example, if we look at breathing, we don't think about that at all. It's automatic. And even something like running, we may have to start the action, but then it looks after itself. When we actually get to some of the skills, with lots of practice, we can make the skills automatic so that the conscious part of the brain can concentrate on the tactics. So by practicing a shot over and over again, the brain becomes so familiar with the action that it's almost automatic. And by practicing lots of different shots, a variety of experiences it can use during a game. But automatic reactions can become predictable. What tactics do players use to overcome this problem? Well, very simply, what happens with good players is they can anticipate each other. But what we can do, of course, is we can use deception. What happens is that one player hits in a particular way, but just before making contact, he does something different with the ball. And the other player who's anticipated one shot is caught out by surprise. It's simply deception. So visual deceptions can fool the brain in tennis, even with skilled players. Professor Richard Gregory is head of the Brain and Perception Laboratory at Bristol University and an expert on visual illusions. How does he explain the visual process? For a long time, people thought simply that light came into the eye, you've got a picture at the back of the eye, and somehow the mind uh, accepts that picture, almost like Brighton Rock. You've got a picture at one end, a picture at the other, and that's all there is to it. In fact, this is entirely wrong. The difference is that you have to read the picture in the eye, or actually the signals coming back from the eye, with action potentials, rather like reading the words in a book. They convey messages. They convey messages of meaning, colour, shape, and we have to put all these signals together, these messages together, to form uh, not really a picture of the world, but an internal description of the world. The messages reach the brain as coded electrical signals about the colour, shape, size and movement of an object. The brain has to put all of these messages together in order to recognise the object. You don't just see red rectangles, you see a bus. The brain does a lot of guess will be fooled. Can you give us an example of that? Well, I'd like to give you several. Um, I think the most simple one is this one. Uh, this is simply a face, or actually two faces. This face on the left is indeed an ordinary face. It's sort of plaster of Paris, but it's a face. This one, however, is not. This is actually hollow. In fact, it's a hollow mould of that face. Now, I can put my hand into this thing, which is actually hollow, but because it appears like an ordinary face, I'm putting my hand kind of into an impossible space. And my hand, when I'm doing this, probably won't make it look correctly hollow. It'll probably still look like an ordinary face. The probability is so low that that's hollow, you just don't see it as hollow. But now look what happens when we move it. They're fixed together rigidly, actually in this box, and you'll see them moving in opposite directions. That's because you assume that this nose is sticking out when it's really in, so all the motions get reversed. And this is even more dramatic if we make them nod. If we make them nod, it really looks weird. And if I make it nod a great deal, you'll always hollow look. The face simply disappears inside the box, doesn't it? And now you'll see it popping out again. As soon as the features become visible outlines, all your knowledge of faces comes back into your brain. It has to be a face because it's got these features. You see it incorrectly, even when you know the answer that it's really hollow. Are there any illusions which make us see something that isn't there? Well, here's a particularly nice one, a triangle figure, which was actually designed by an Italian, Conizza, the Conizza Triangle. And you'll see it's actually black lines with gaps in and then little cakes with slices out. And what you see is more than that. You see a white illusory triangle, sort of whiter than white, with edges on it. Now, the edges are not really there. The difference in brightness is not really there. And you can prove that by drawing it for yourself, if you like. And we can simplify it and change it. If you change the angle of the slices on the cakes, then we can make a curved illusory triangle. 
and we can actually get rid of the cakes, have little dots, and lo and behold, you've still got an illusory triangle. Not quite so strong, but it's there. The evidence from dots is not quite as good as cakes with bits missing, which are unlikely to occur by chance. So our brain creates a triangle to fill an unexpected gap. Now, some illusions seem completely impossible. Can you explain that? Yes, um, the tricky one. The world itself cannot really be paradoxical, but descriptions of it can, and perceptions are kind of descriptions of the world, like language. For example, there's a drawing by Lionel and Roger Penrose which looks like a triangle. At first sight it looks like a triangle, but when you look at it, you see the corners don't tie up. It's impossible, paradoxical. It's an impossible paradoxical triangle. Well, here's the object that is impossible, although it actually exists, made of three pieces of wood, just as impossible as the picture. Now, there's a space here which exists in the model, but not in your brain. I'm going to put my hand into that space. If I move my hand like that, it looks pretty jolly odd, doesn't it? Because that space is simply not in how you see this thing. I'll do it again, like that. So let's see how this is made. I'm going to rotate it, and you'll see that it's not really a triangle at all. It's an object like that, spread out in depth. But when these two are lined up, you assume they're actually touching, actually at the same distance, and that's why it's so odd putting one's hand in it. You've got a false assumption, and it's a false assumption that is generating the paradox, the impossible perception. Let's bring them back again, and then you can see it again, impossible, although you know the answer which I find quite worrying. This paradox is resolvable. Uh, we managed to make it, but some are not. Now here is an animation of a picture by the Dutch artist Escher. Uh, can this be made? Can it be resolved or not? I don't know quite whether it's possible. Maybe you can think how to do it. So, in some ways, our senses are limited, but we do have the ability to extend our senses. We can extend our sight with a periscope. So we can see over the heads of a crowd. With fiber optics, we can see right inside the body. We can't hear ultrasound, but it can be used to scan a baby in the womb and then convert it to a visual signal. Cameras help us to see details we'd normally miss by slowing an action down. Or by speeding a slow process up. We can see things we're not normally sensitive to as well, like x-rays. Even a simple optical microscope can reveal a world too small for the naked eye. At the other extreme, telescopes enable us to see for vast distances. By using scientific instruments to extend our senses, we can see beyond our world to distant galaxies but we still need the brain to analyze and interpret the information. We're beginning to understand the universe, but we have a long way to go before we understand the brain.